As for the Cold War, we should be grateful that it ended peacefully. Yet gratitude offers no excuse for erasing from memory sins committed along the way. A mindless nuclear arms race, the criminal folly of Vietnam, and Washington's penchant for coups, assassinations, and dirty tricks while befriending corrupt dictators. Rather than celebration, the end of the Cold War ought to have offered an occasion for remorse and repentance. For decades now, historians and journalists have been poking holes in this grand narrative to no avail. It persists, not because it is true, but because it has served the interests of what some have come to call the blob, the Washington national security apparatus. The grand narrative is familiar and convenient and therefore facilitates the manipulation of a patriotic but gullible public. And of course, it greases the wheels of politics. As someone recently once said in another context, it's all about the Benjamins, baby. So attempting to dismantle the grand narrative altogether is probably a futile proposition. What just might be possible is to argue that recent administrations have misconstrued and distorted that tradition uh, at great cost to the American people. Our post 9-11 wars illustrates the consequences of misapplying that tradition. Recall that jo the George W. Bush administration styled the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan as wars of liberation, part of a larger campaign to destroy a so-called axis of evil. President Bush was explicitly appropriating and repurposing the grand narrative, his global war on terrorism, advertised as the means to complete the work begun during the, cold, during the Good War and continued during the Cold War. The result, of course, has been a disaster for the United States and for the various peoples we set out to liberate. Indeed, Nita Crawford and her colleagues have spent nearly a decade tabulating the results. Her work deserves far more attention than it has received, particularly in this city. There ought to be a running tally displayed in the Capitol Rotunda, showing the trillions wasted, the lives snuffed out in ruin, the populations displaced and radicalized. President Trump, of all people, recognizes how misguided and costly our policies in the greater Middle East have been since 9-11. Yet note how vigorously the blob pushes back against his stated desire to wind down American wars in the region. What Trump hasn't done, and indeed is, is doubtless incapable of doing, is to articulate an alternative approach to global leadership, a revision of the grand narrative that will align it with actual existing conditions. Now, my time is limited. Peter's already looking at me. So <laughs> 13 let, seconds. So let me specify just two items that should figure prominently in this revised narrative. Item one, climate change. Growing numbers of Americans are coming to an appreciation that climate change poses an existential threat to our country. Item two, the changing configuration of power in Asia. Certainly, China poses the great geopolitical challenge of the 21st century. The response to that challenge cannot be war. It must be an effort to devise a new balance of power. So indeed, we need a new narrative on which to ground US policy. It should begin with a candid recognition that the existing grand narrative is riddled with half-truths and fictions. It should incorporate a realistic appreciation of how the world is changing. In short, we need to rethink radically what it means to lead. Thank you. He's not joined us, but I want to commend Representative Khanna and the Congressional Progressive Caucus's leaders for working to reimagine a humane, progressive foreign policy to work to change the narrative. And to acknowledge Representative Khanna's tireless work to ensure that Congress reassert its constitutional power over war by passing a historic war powers resolution. I think it's extraordinarily important that Congress reassert its role in matters of war and peace. Although presidential campaigns generally uh, feature kitchen table concerns, so to speak. 2020 is shaping up already to feature a long overdue debate over US foreign and national security strategy. The failures of the national security establishment, uh, the blob, uh, make a reassessment inevitable. In 2016, as Andrew Basevich alluded to, Trump sensed that opening, but his America First 
turned out to be a bumper sticker, not a strategy. And now progressives in the Congress and on the campaign trail are beginning to define what I'd call a new realism that contrasts sharply with both the keepers of that old orthodoxy and Trump's posturing. Leaders allied with emerging movements, and I know we'll talk a little bit about sort of new infrastructure, new pipelines that are needed to build out a progressive foreign policy. But those leaders who begin to lay out a common sense foreign policy of progressive realism and restraint will find a responsive public. I mean, surveys, many of you know this, show Democrats, progressives support decreasing America's military presence overseas, oppose higher military spending as the cost of the post 9-11 wars, deplete needed funding for urgent domestic needs. Progressives can't allow legitimate outrage at Trump's presidency to, to distract them from the challenges ahead internationally. The US, as Andy Basevich has written about so well, is mired in wars without end, without victory. The quote, liberal global order praised by the foreign policy establishment has generated obscene inequality and failed to address the real present and growing threat posed by catastrophic climate change. The Pentagon, despite wasting billions of dollars, now has a budget greater than that under President Ronald Reagan at the height of the first or second Cold War. Our trade policies have rigged the rules for global corporations and banks with devastating effect on American workers and communities. I would argue what's needed is a clear articulation of a new strategy of progressive realism. It would focus on these emerging challenges to our security, our democracy, particularly catastrophic climate change and a growing inequality. And it would embrace realist skepticism about regime change, military intervention, policing of the world, while sustaining American support for international law and democracy. It would enlist allies to restructure the global economic rules so they work for the many, not simply the few. And it would focus on rebuilding the United States, making us a beacon rather than a menace. I've always believed our security is best served when we provide a model for the values we champion. We might valuably focus, therefore, on strengthening our, our democracy and economy at home. I believe the greatest threat today comes not from meddling by Russia or other foreign actors, but rather from the flood of dark money into our elections, the anti-democratic un-American efforts to suppress votes and the gerrymandering of electoral districts. So I'm hoping that with the control of the House, a presidential campaign that's already begun, progressives have a unique opportunity to define what I would call a people's foreign policy, not simply react to Trump's endless provocations. If I might close with what may seem heretical, but I believe a common sense view. We're watching much of the foreign policy establishment ramping up to confront both Russia and China in a new Cold War, this national security strategy. I mean, it's going to drive those two countries closer together, staggering costs, danger. Generally, I believe, and I know Andy spoke of the Cold War in the past, I believe we're in a more dangerous Cold War. And more generally, I believe Cold Wars are lousy for progressives. They empower the military industrial complex, the war powers on both sides, nationalist fervor rises, civil liberties are violated, diplomacy is sidelined, the space for activism and dissent closes. I'm almost there. Having worked with courageous Russian dissidents, journalists, and feminist NGOs for more than three decades, I've seen how Cold War tensions have been used to suppress independent voices in both countries. So I hope that we will talk a little bit more about the danger of this new Cold War. I do think the space for dissent on Russia policy has never been narrower than it is today. And those who stray from the dominant narrative, including our host today, Representative Hanna, are often the target of toxic smears. Uh, so let us also understand the perils of the new nuclear arms race. We're now listening to people talk about usable low yield nukes. I mean, this is strange love talk 2019. And we need to fight to maintain the pillars of arms control as Trump and his administration and John Bolton, who committed the original sin in 2002, unraveling that anti-ballistic missile treaty, now take aim at the INF. So I just want to say that arguing the US and Russia have a mutual interest in maintaining some working relationship, not a friendship, to resolve escalating conflicts and challenges such as nuclear proliferation, climate change, may not be popular these days. But I believe sober realism on the U.S.-Russian relationship is urgently needed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all right, I'm next. I'll try to be as tough a moderator on myself as on everybody else. Um, I was asked just to talk specifically about U.S. policy and U.S. debate um, uh, about Israel-Palestine. Um, I don't think we yet really have a debate 
about American policy towards Israel and Palestine. What we really have more is a debate about the debate, a debate about what the legitimate contours of the debate are, who gets to be part of it, what you're allowed to say, and what you can't say. And that's not really by accident. That's a strategy. If you look at the kind of the quote unquote pro-Israel establishment, it always wants to focus on the question of, of the motives and the standing of people who might criticize Israeli policy or criticize American support for Israeli policy rather than actually criticize, than, than focusing on the policy itself and whether those things ally with uh, progressive values or even with American interests. And it's an effective strategy because most politicians and even most activists don't really have to care about this issue in particular. It's not something which intrudes on their lives in the way that climate change or health care does. Many people don't have any personal experience with it, don't feel particularly knowledgeable about it. So you often, I often have the sense talking to people uh, on this issue, especially folks who are outside the Jewish community, that essentially for them it's a little, the, the whole subject is a little bit like walking through a, mindful, with a, through a minefield wearing a blindfold, right? You'd rather just not enter into it at all. Or if someone offers you a guide, a uh, hand, and says, I can take you through this minefield, and you'll get out alive on the other side, they're, they're pretty happy for the guidance. Um, but I do think that um, when the debate um, breaks out, things could start to change quite quickly. Um, because there are a couple of salient fundamental unavoidable realities that when people confront them uh, are kind of showstoppers, right? Mm -hmm. One is that Palestinians who live in the West Bank have fewer rights than African Americans in Mississippi in the 1950s. African Americans in Mississippi under Jim Crow were at least theoretically citizens of the country in which they lived, even though they couldn't actually exercise the rights of citizenship, for instance, like the right to vote. Palestinians in the West Bank live under Israeli control in different ways, but entirely under the dominant. Every day from morning until night, their lives are dominated by the state of Israel, which is the state under which they live. And yet they are not even theoretically citizens of the state in which they live. They live under an entirely different legal system than their Israeli Jewish neighbors. The second reality is that Israel controls the Gaza Strip. Israel does not have a border with the Gaza Strip. If, when you are a child born in the Gaza Strip, you have to be entered into a computer which goes into the Israeli computer database, and that determines whether you can leave or come and go. Israel controls Gaza, and the UN says that Gaza will be uninhabitable by 2020. And although Hamas bears some of the responsibility from that, you can't divorce that from the fact that, Hamas, that Gaza has been shut off from the rest of the world. For instance, Israel only allows people in Gaza to export two vegetables out of Gaza. Um, and, the, when the, and the United States underwrites all this. And when these things are stated starkly for people, and you move away from all of the questions about who has the right to enter the conversation and what their motives are, and these things are stated starkly, they simply become indefensible if you have a progressive outlook, if you believe in human equality and in equal rights. And so I think there are three things that could really fundamentally change the debate. The first is simply to take people to see for themselves. That uh, I think it's a scandal, frankly, that, that progressives have not raised the money to create a mass version of their own uh, version of the APAC script. I have seen people whose entire worldview on this issue has collapsed in a half a day mm -hmm. in the West Bank. The realities that I described in the abstract are utterly different from seeing it ground level for yourself. It's a shattering experience. Part of the reason the American Jewish establishment itself may ultimately shatter is that even the most, even right-wing pro-American Jewish donors, when they are taken by groups like Encounter to spend time in the West Bank, come back shattered by the experience. Politicians will be shattered by the experience if somebody takes them. The second thing that could change the debate is to put Palestinians on stage. They're right now almost entirely off stage in the media and conversations about these conversations. But oftentimes, they're the people with the most knowledge of this subject. And simply putting them on stage changes the conversation quite dramatically. And the third thing is that if an American politician in the 2016 campaign, and I have one in, in mind who I think might, but maybe I'll be surprised, <laughs> simply says to his fellow or her fellow Democratic candidates, why are we giving three plus billion dollars no, with no strings attached to an Israeli government that is, that is overseeing this level of human rights abuse? I think the minute that 
question gets posed on, in a democratic presidential campaign, the debate changes because th there is no good answer for that question. It's simply, an, it's, simply, we simply, it's simply a question of who will have the political courage to pose it. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure being here, and my uh, gratitude to Congressman Ro Khanna and the CPC for putting this together. Uh, time is limited. I want to avoid repeating what others already have said or addressed. I will try to only make two points in this five or hopefully seven minutes you will give me. <laughs> First one is the need for um, a, a stronger intellectual framework for the foreign policy of the progressives. And the second one is the need to find and more effectively utilize the counter examples of Iraq that progressives actually own, but have not been promoting as efficiently as they could, and I think particularly about the Iran nuclear deal. So on the first point, Andrew mentioned that there is an overarching narrative, and that narrative essentially is hegemonic in this city, at least within the blob, uh, and a counter to that uh, has not really been adopted. And I would take it a little bit further and say that what progressives have right now uh, is a foreign policy that to a very large extent is driven from the values that they have on domestic issues and they're trying to extrapolate that into how that would be on foreign policy. It's not a bad path at all, but it is probably insufficient to be able to create the type of intellectual framework that a foreign policy doctrine ultimately needs. There are intellectual frameworks out there. And let me also say why this is so important. The neoconservatives actually have a very well thought through um, uh, framework for their foreign policy. Now, I know everyone was like, what are you saying? But give me a second. Uh, this framework, however flawed it may be, uh, is something that gives them two very critical advantages. There's probably more, but I'm only gonna mention two right now. First of all, it reduces the transaction cost in terms of time and resources to figure out where they stand on any new scenario that emerges. Because they have this framework, they can very quickly figure out their position and make sure that they coordinate. Secondly, because of this, they can also herd the cats much more efficiently than what you can if you don't have a framework, because everyone is essentially reading from the same script, which means that much easier for them to be able to coordinate it and act in unison uh, and with the type of unity that is needed in order for them to be able to really be influential. Progressives right now, in the absence of such a framework, tend to end up in the same place, but the road there is much longer, tends to be much more messy, uh, is not as certain, and as a result, oftentimes leave the impression that they actually are not united until they reach the end point. But by the time they reach the end point, they have certainly lost the first mover's advantage because the neoconservatives and others who have a framework uh, act much faster and as a result uh, have a bigger initial impact on forming the narrative. Fortunately, as Katrina mentioned, there are ar uh, intellectual architects out there. Uh, some call it restraint, some call it offshore balancing, progressive realism. These are frameworks that, with various variations, are the ones that most closely align with the values that progressives already hold, and almost invariably reach to very, very similar, if not identical, po policy recommendations. Uh, I would hope that more attention would be brought into this because as progressives start to play an increasingly important role in the foreign policy making, particularly within the Democratic Party, it's going to be extremely difficult to compete with the others unless a framework is adopted and internalized. The second point is on counterexamples. Uh, with good reason, we have been criticizing the Iraq war and uh, pointing to it as an example of neoconservative foreign policy. With all of its disasters, the instability, the uh, destruction of the Middle East, the radicalization, uh, and of course, ultimately, the rise of ISIS as a result of it. What is more difficult is to be able to point to a positive example of our own, a case in which, you know, we almost went to war, but we managed to avoid it because we invested in multilateral diplomacy, we collaborated with our allies, we went for a compromise instead of just pushing for uh, the other side to submit and, and capitulate, uh, and we essentially chose wisdom uh, and dialogue over militarism and coercion. There is such an example. It's the Iran nuclear deal. Mm -hmm. It is an amazing achievement. Rob Malley, 
is largely responsible for reaching this amazing achievement. In my view, truly a triumph of diplomacy. We avoided a war. We avoided uh, um, uh, the Iranians being able to move towards a nuclear weapon. But I fear that we have done far too little in elevating that as the progressive counterexample to Iraq. Instead of just criticizing the other side of not knowing how to do foreign policy, pointing to it and say, this is actually how you're supposed to do foreign policy, because look how well that worked out. Perhaps there was some nervousness earlier on because people were concerned whether the Iranians would live up to the deal or not, but they did. In fact, they're continuing to live up to it even when the United States under Trump is violating the agreement. I think we need to uh, elevate this further as the counter example to Iraq. And there's also, and if you give me just 30 extra seconds, a danger within the Democratic Party right now that I want to address. Some Democrats are arguing that we should go back to the JCPOA, but we should renegotiate it. We should use Trump's leverage that he has created in order to extract more concessions from the other side. The leverage, of course, is a reference to the fact that Trump has violated a UN Security Council resolution, is punishing our European allies for actually trying to live up to the deal. I hope no progressives think that we should renegotiate Paris instead of just going back into it and essentially try to extract more concessions from Mother Nature before we agree to go back into the Paris Agreement. Well, if we're not going to do it on Paris, we should not do it uh, on the Iran deal either. So I think it's critical that progressives adopt a position of a clean re-entry into the JCPA for the sake of rebuilding America's own conf uh, uh, credibility by living up to the obligations that it already has uh, uh, said yes to. Thanks so much. Spending at over $700 billion a year that is unsustainable. We've been run since 9-11 by our amygdalas, that is the fear centers of our brain, not by the people of corporates. But even the huge amount of money that uh, Congress has appropriated to fight the war on terror does not count everything that we've spent. The cost of war estimates uh, of spending include the appropriations, but the fact is that we be paying for these wars run by our amygdala, well into the middle of the century, when the sea levels have already rise, risen. So uh, this war, these wars, in fact, will likely cost much more than 40 years of nuclear weapons building. So the current strategy on the war on terror are ineffective and counterproductive. It has not brought lasting peace in the war zones. The liberated zones in Iraq and Syria are largely rubble. The civilian death toll in Afghanistan last year, 2018, was the highest, highest since the beginning of that war. U.S. and Afghan government control of territory in Afghanistan is less than it was the year before, and less than the year before that, and less than the year before that. The Afghan national uh, police and military are hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging uh, officers with 30 to 40 deaths per day. Each day. There's 45,000 uh, killed since 2014. The U.S. has armed Pakistan, which is abusing its own citizens in the Fatah. They've armed Saudi Arabia in their war against Yemen. The terrorist threat is arguably no better or no worse than in 2002. Most recent statements by conservatives say, though, that the U.S. military is in dire shape, that it needs more investment and, and uh, money, equipment, and training. They argue that the U.S. is in a deteriorating position. We've heard this before. They need more. The Pentagon wants us to turn pivot, tilt, or swivel to the Pacific <laughs> and China. They are also concerned about threats posed by climate change, specifically in report after report over the last 10 years. They say they fear rising sea levels at naval and air bases, increased demand for them to respond to climate-caused natural disasters, and the political unrest and war that they believe will follow through threat, conflicts over water resources, famine, and climate refugee flows, and so on. 
They have responded chiefly by focusing on the vulnerable bases and have invested in making their equipment more resilient to extreme heat. They moved some generators up to the second floor. Global warming is caused by burning fossil fuels, natural gas, coal, and petroleum. Carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide are the results. Those are the emissions. Yet the DOP has not made the link to their role in climate change. The Department of Defense is the single largest consumer of petroleum in the world. It burns more oil than many countries in the world. It burns a great deal of oil, protecting access to oil. The U.S. military is, in other words, the single larger producer of greenhouse gases. I estimate that between 2001 and 2017, U.S. military greenhouse gas emissions were 1.7 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide. Of those emissions, I estimate that 64% or so were for war, the post-9-11 wars, and patrolling that oil, uh, policing the Persian Gulf. The Pentagon documents on global warming usually take the worst case scenarios as certain. Mm -hmm. They are not. We have time to dramatically decrease greenhouse gas emissions to make those nightmare scenarios, which they paint so vividly, less likely. The new foreign policy should include reductions in fossil fuels used by the Pentagon and by the US. Not, it's not just a matter of monitoring the thermostats in the Pentagon or intense in Afghanistan, which the U.S. done, or changing policies on idling tanks, which is one of the solutions proposed, or improving fuel economy and the V2 bomber from 4.2 to 3 gallons per mile. We need to reconsider the missions that are fuel intensive, which is all of them. We need to close bases in the Middle East and the US and convert them into more productive use. We need a new round of RAC, which, by the way, the Pentagon is in favor of, but administrations have stopped. We need to start including all military fuel use and greenhouse gas emissions inventories. They were excluded in the Kyoto Protocol. We need to require the Pentagon to report its fuel consumption. It deliberately does not do that to Congress. All empires fall when they overextend their militaries, when they make too many enemies and overspend their blood and treasure. Everyone. Mm -hmm. But the need is more urgent than addressing the potential loss of U.S. privacy. War with China or North Korea is possible. Global warming is certain. The Pentagon should stop making the situation they fear their worst case scenario more likely. Thank you. And now, uh, uh, hitting cleanup will be Rob Malley. Thank you, and thank you, Congressman, uh, for organizing this. Um, since Sony have spoken before me extremely well and said most of what I'd want to say, I'm going to start with. Uh, provocative statement and to maybe change the tone a little bit and say we owe President Trump a huge grade of that gratitude. Now, he deserves a lot else from us, but he does, we do owe him a debt of gratitude because he has forced this kind of conversation that we're having now, and he's given it more visibility, and he's given it more room. Because he's, he's forced the democratic slash progressive community to confront two temptations. The first temptation is a temptation of isolationism, and I think both Andrew and Katrina said it's true that he expressed the view of many uh, in this country, uh, including Democrats, when he came out against the forever wars and he came out against the temptation of entanglement in the Middle East. But the answer he gave, which is America first, which is a valueless uh, foreign policy, which is a foreign policy that is full of contradictions and that is hurting not only the United States, but hurting the countries in which the United States is, being, is involved, has forced Democrats, progressive Democrats, to make a distinction between the kind of is transactional isolation, whatever we want to call it, because there's a lot of intervention in it as well, of President Trump, and the kind of new internationalism that I think uh, Democrats, progressives have to come up with, which is not 
the neoconservative vision, but not uh, the isolation, transactional, uh, valueless policy of President Trump. The second uh, temptation that he's forced uh, Democrats to confront is a temptation of the alliance with never Trumpers. And again, I think it's a point that we've heard already today. Early on in the administration, there was a view among, and there still is a view among some Democrats, that the real alliance to be forged is be between moderate Democrats and those in the Republican Party who dislike President Trump and who are going after him for what he's doing in Syria, the way he's dealing with Kim Jong-un, the way he's dealing with, with, uh, with Russia. Whereas I would argue, and that's what we're hearing here, the real bridge, the real divide to be bridged is within the Democratic Party between the, those who have been associated with the blob and those mm -hmm. who, are, so, who are more identified with the views that we're hearing today. And I think President Trump is, is forcing that reckoning as well. What is the platform of the Democratic Party going forward? Is it one that's gonna try to build bridges with never Trumpists or with progressive progressives? Now having, that's the frame for me, and that's why I, I think we do owe uh, something to President Trump. And then as we heard today, the number of questions that this raises that I think we've begun to scratch the surface of but we haven't really yet uh, uh, answered. Um, the first question I think is, what does it mean in a progressive foreign policy to be anti-interventionist? What does it mean? I mean, when you have to confront the question of the withdrawal from Syria, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, it's divided many Democrats. So what does it actually mean to be anti-interventionist? And can you be anti-interventionist while still promoting human rights, democracy, and forms of governance overseas without falling into the trap of entanglement? Is that possible? Where's the balance? And can you do so without imposing sanctions that seem very easy and clinical, but actually have very real impact? And as Peter said, you could see you have to be on the ground to see what the impact is. Well, my colleagues at the International Crisis Group were in the ground in Iraq, in the ground today in other countries, and they see the real impact of sanctions. And drawing that line between being of the world and trying to promote human rights and, and democracy and other forms, but without intervening militarily and without making the people you want to help suffer, that's one challenge I think that progressives uh, have to confront. The other challenge, second challenge they have to confront is breaking some of these taboos. Peter spoke extremely uh, uh, passionately and articulately about one of those taboos, which, which is the taboo of what we can, what is the uh, legitimate discourse when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. And I don't need to add anything to what he said, but that is one conversations, conversation that needs to be had. Another one is on Iran, and, and, and Trita mentioned it. When you go to a panel and Democrats speak about Iran, there's always the necessary, what I'd call the throat clearing. You first have to premise everything you say by saying that Iran is the worst country in the Middle East, that we have to combat its, its actions, that we have to go after its missile program, they have to go after its, whatever it's doing in the region. Having said that, then, then you could say something about how you're not in favor of military intervention, you're in favor of the JCPOA, but then, as Trita said, many people will say, well, maybe we should have a stronger JCPOA. We should be much less defensive, much less defensive about the discussion about Israel-Palestine, and much less defensive about the conversation about, about uh, Iran and the JCPOA in terms of what it is that we think is, is, is the right policy. And the third issue, the taboo, is this taboo about having to say that the United States is an exceptional country, that it is the indispensable nation. Again, we heard from Andrew and Katrina. We need to be able to have answers to that because it's very hard to have an argument where you don't first preface what you say by saying that. Um, next, the next challenge, again, uh, speakers before me have addressed it, is how do you deal with a new geopolitical world with threats from China and, um, and, what, and what Russia is doing to disrupt our democracy without falling into the trap of a new Cold War. My final point, um, we do face a, a foreign policy challenge that if coming up with something new, as, as Trita said. The easy part of this challenge was to counter uh, uh, George W. Bush and the Iran, Iraq War. Everyone, at least everyone in the Democratic Party, could come out today against it, and including many Republicans. That's the easy part, the a foreign policy where you have 100,000 uh, soldiers that are invading another country. I think very few people today are going to stand up and advocate it. They may advocate policies that could lead to it, but they won't advocate that. The harder point, as I said, is what, what, what is the opposition to policies that goes beyond opposition to the Iraq war? And how do you answer what I think is going to be the biggest challenge, and which is the reason why we haven't yet broken with this narrative. The reason why President Obama, who I think would, I can't speak for him, but I think he'd agree with a lot of the instincts here, but yet his foreign policy, as many here have written, did not really break as much with the past as, as ought to have been the case. But that's because there's always the threat. Again, you're not talking about the invasion a la Iraq, but there's always a threat that if something goes wrong, if there's a terrorist attack tomorrow, 
or if the US is countered in some other country, that would, the accusation of weakness, of not having done enough for our national defense, that those are gonna to come to haunt any democratic administration. So how do you develop a foreign policy that is focused on climate change, focused on some of these issues, without being vulnerable to that ever-present shadow, which I, I lived under in, during the years of the Obama administration, always afraid, what will happen if things go wrong, and how are you gonna counter the accusation of weakness? And if that's not answered, then a lot of this discussion will not resist the first encounter with reality. Um, thank you. So we're gonna talk among ourselves uh, for a little while. We're, not talking, we're, gonna, we're gonna start the conversation here and then, and then uh, open it up to questions. There's a lot on which I think folks on this panel would agree, and so I wanna try to focus on maybe a couple areas where there could be a disagreement. And Trita talked about the difficulties in sometimes in taking progressive values and figuring out how to translate them in the international scene. And it seems to me one of those areas where it's not self-evident how progressive values fit in is when it has to do with the potential for great power conflict. So I wanted to ask folks a little bit to think about what a progressive policy towards China would be. Should progressives care whether China dominates the South China Sea? Should progressives care if Huawei is building the 5G network all around the world? Should progressives care if China ultimately retakes Taiwan? Um, what would, this seems to me, in my experience, those are the kinds of issues, as opposed to global warming in Iran, around, around which progressives generally have the least to say, and perhaps it's because they're hidden disagreements. So, uh, Professor Basevich, would you like to, to start? No. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, Confession number one is that I'm not a progressive. Uh, I'm actually a conservative. Me, that doesn't mean I have anything, any regard for the Republican Party, but I do view myself as a conservative. As Katrina knows, I firmly believe in the imperative of trying to nurture a dialogue between responsible conservatives and progressives as a way to begin to uh, establish a new narrative and push back against uh, the blob. But I think on, on China, my view is that the reality of great power politics uh, necessarily overrides uh, human rights concerns. Uh, that, or to, to flip it around a little bit, the catastrophic consequences for the globe, not just for the United States, of failing to find a way to manage China's rise to the to great power status uh, is, a, is a problem of such magnitude that I think that I would vote for prioritizing that over uh, human rights concerns. Now, it is not one or the other, but in terms of having a clear-eyed vision uh, for what we must do for our own interests and for the well-being of the planet, ensuring that the rise of China does not create war-making instability in East Asia is a really, really, really important thing. Uh, anyone else like to jump in on this? Please. I think our current policies actually make China more aggressive and this could be a, a long conversation, but uh, in many ways, I think it does. Uh, but, but secondly, the rise of China economically is only helped by the priorities in spending and investment that the US has. In other words, uh, by investing so much, being so preeminent in terms of military spending and resources, devoted towards that in our economy, we've let other parts wither or at least not fostered their growth. Now, in terms of Huawei building 5G or 6G or whatever next G we get, I think that's not a great idea. Americans can build those things. But that has little to do, in my view, with uh, the power politics that we're talking about here. I think our policies make them more aggressive. And then Katrina. Thank you. Um, first, it's a great question, Peter, but I think we first also have to remember that 
even if in a progressive foreign policy, the inevitable compromises of reality would have to come in and you have to prioritize. Let's not forget that that's anyway different from what's actually already taking place. It's not as if the United States right now has a purest human rights policy anywhere. Um, just see what is going on with Israel-Palestine, as you mentioned, or Saudi Arabia. I think we have to first make sure that when it comes to human rights um, and that the avoidance of a scenario in which we have to make it into either or, as Andrew said, it's not either or. It's to have a framework that allows us to be able to pursue policies that are necessary while minimizing or actually making the values compatible and if necessary, minimizing any compromises there. That's the framework that we have to find. Um, and part of the promotion of human rights has to go back to the basics. I think someone else mentioned it earlier on. We are really not in a fantastic position to really criticize others. That's not to say that others don't deserve criticism, and China, I think, certainly does. But the true leadership that I think progressive foreign policy would aim at would be to make sure that we are a source of emulation, that other countries look at us and they want to copy what we're doing because we're doing it so well, we're living up to our values, not by us forcing any values down the throat of others or to instrumentalize it in the way that it has been done to far too much of an extent in the past, in which we're actually using human rights, not for the sake of human rights, but we're instrumentalizing as another tool of foreign policy to put pressure on countries that we disagree with. So step number one would be to make sure that we're living up to human rights at home so that we are a source of inspiration uh, rather than thinking that we should use it as an instrument of pressure. So just riffing off of uh, what Frida said, I, I, I did say that I thought in order to make um, the United States a beacon and putting aside the question of exceptionalism, we would be wise to get our own house in order before we go out into the world to remake other countries. On the other hand, you know, you come to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, something this country got right in the UN. And, you know, human rights are also economic and social. Um, I think that's worth remembering. On China, I will say my main role is not coming to these wonderful forums, and I thank Representative Hanna for the, uh, for the invitation, but as being editor of The Nation, and we've just assigned a piece um, about, you know, how the left thinks about China. What, I mean, it's, it's a complicated question because there are all of these different issues roiling the pot. And it, it's, uh, you know, we have a reporter talking to about 30 people, uh, human rights, geopolitical, mavens, um, legal uh, hi historians. So I think that's important. I would say one thing that I think progressives, and I uh, want to just c come off of what An Andrew said, um, it is the case Andrew has written extensively for the nation, even while he's written and is an editor at the American Conservative. And I think there's an important role in these times not to ally with never Trumpers, but to consider transpartisan alliances, which made the invocation of the War Powers Act possible with Mike Lee uh, as a co-sponsor. But the national security strategy, which was, tell me, I think it was beginning of this year, was put forth, it demotes the global war on terror which should never have been a war, uh, and elevates China and Russia as our greatest threats. And I think as progressives, one recoils from that framework, and I think it makes it almost impossible to take on what Nita Crawford spoke of. I mean, how do you reduce defense budgets if you're now virtually, you know, in a virtual war with two great powers, and you're driving them together, uh, which has its own costs and consequences, and um, I think this is an important moment to uh, push back against the new blob, so to speak, which has put forth this, this uh, geopolitical framework. Um, so if we're gonna, I just say one thing about what Nita said. One thing we've been looking at at The Nation is how to revive, if people remember, conversion, Seymour Melman, just transition. And I think it's an opportunity to think hard at a moment when uh, there is talk about reducing the defense budget, what is sustainable, what is a real alternative, is something progressives should be, do some real work on, and I think would, as I said earlier, meet with support in a country where the disconnect between the elite and people grows every day. Uh, quickly, and, and then I want to get to Rob. Well, I, I wanted to pose my own question yeah. to the panel, if sure. you could, so 
Uh, sure. Go, go for it. Just give him the mic. Uh, give Sorry, the mic. I'm, I'm interested in hearing uh, the views of anyone, but I think particularly of Trita and Rob, uh, on the issue of the competition between Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran, I guess, uh, to become a dominant power in the Persian Gulf. And, and I know where we stand right now in that uh, competition, but what would be your advice and counsel on what ought to be the position of the United States with regard to that matter? And if I could just actually just frame it a little bit, what should progressives have, you know, emotionally there was obviously a lot of enthusiasm for after, uh, given the nature of this Saudi regime, basically to say screw them after the Khashoggi murder. But but what's a, what's a realistic, is that a realistic progressive foreign policy or what should the progressive foreign policy towards Saudi Arabia be? So why don't we go to Robin and Peter if you want to get I don't know if screw them is ever realistic foreign policy, but uh, yeah. maybe. Um, like, tempting sounds very militant. <laughs> um, I, I think the main thing is to avoid, as you say, we know where we are now. We're now at the risk of being entangled in a conflict because of an alliance that has, you know, has historical antecedent, but the reasons for the proximity of that alliance no longer really exist. So it doesn't, my view is not you cut off Saudi Arabia, but you need to be much tougher with them in terms of when they are dragging us or when they're dragging the region in ways that we think are detrimental to our interests. The, 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 the war in Yemen is item, you know, exhibit A, B, and C, but we should not have, we should never have allowed ourselves, and this is one for which the Obama administration has to take a good share of blame, but should not have allowed ourselves to be, uh, to be, have enabled that operation, to have been in any way complicit in it. Uh, and then the broader, the broader policy, I think, is we need to understand that ultimately, and again, this President Obama said, but maybe not in the most felicitous way, he said, Iran and Saudi Arabia are gonna have to learn to share the region. There's going to have to be some balancing between the two. Now, by sharing it, he, there was an, we're, not, we're not talking about a Yalta where they're going to divide countries, but they're going to have to come to terms. And I think the U.S. role, to the extent the U.S. wants to play a role in this, should be to encourage both sides to come to terms and reach some kind of, uh, 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 some kind of agreement about the security architecture of the region without getting dragged in, certainly not into Sunni Shiite or a Persian Arab war, which is what some of our allies would like us to do, and we've been too tempted uh, to, to do in the past. So. I, my, you know, my view is that we need to be set limits whenever we support a country. I mean, you know, people say, I've had some Saudis say, well, how could you, you, you treat us uh, the same way you treat Iran? Well, nobody's treating them the same way as we're treating Iran. The question is whether we should give them the kind of support we're giving them or whether it should be much more conditional, conditional on them acting in ways in the region that we think are consistent with, at a minimum, our interests, I'd say also our values. Um, and if they're not, then we should not be having that, providing them that kind of support, those, those kind of military sales and that kind of enabling of their, uh, of their attitude. So I don't, wouldn't sc say screw to them, either to them or to anyone else, but I'd say there's some conditions for the kind of relationship we want. And our vision for the region is one in which there's not a competition between the two, but there's some kind of security architecture in which both of their core interests can be, uh, can be accommodated. Peter, do you want to get on that? Um, I, I very much agree with what Rob said, and I would just add, we have to ask ourselves, why is it that it's so difficult for us to be able to actually play that role of trying to find a good balance there? Well, number one, we don't have relations with Iran. Mm -hmm. This is completely hampering our ability to be able to play that uh, diplomatic role to actually stabilize the region rather than just uh, pu pushing more weapons into the region. And secondly, because we have taken the Saudi-US relationship to a level that is really difficult to justify. We are all too often following their lead, including uh, giving the support for um, the, the Yemen war that already started a couple of years before uh, uh, Trump came in. So those are two key issues that need to be addressed in order for us to be able to reach the point in which we can play that helpful role. But when it comes to that role, I, I agree fully. Um, ultimately, when the United States adopts a position of not taking sides in the region. It signals everyone who is a friend of the United States that that option, which they constantly currently think is available, the option of, oh, I can actually get the United States to come in and tilt the scale in my favor. When that option is gone, I think you will see a completely different realism among some of these countries, particularly Saudi Arabia. The Saudis right now have no reason to adopt a realistic position on any of these issues from Yemen to Iran because they have a guy in the White House who they, at least the son of law of it, they think is in their pocket. And as a result, they're willing to fully exhaust that option of getting the United States to drag it into this conflict before they are willing to look at any other 
um, uh, possibilities that it actually would force them to compromise. And it's not an irrational position that they've taken. It's a completely rational response to the irrational position that we have taken. If we change this position, uh, uh, I would not be surprised if the Saudi position would adjust rather quickly to it. You know, why don't I give you the last word and then we'll go to questions. Right. I think that there's a, a serious need to rethink all of this, our assumptions about the Persian Gulf. I think the worst case scenario, which everyone I, I think has feared for decades, is that some power would dominate the Persian Gulf and maybe block the Strait of Hormuz. Right? That's the, the giant fear. But the United States is much less dependent. In fact, the world is much less dependent on this oil. China is more dependent on Persian Gulf oil than the US and, and most of uh, the European countries. Right? So, it, and, and if there were one power that came to dominate the region, guess what? They'd still want to sell the oil. Right? So a price spike might occur but they have an incentive to sell oil. I think we have a lot of assumptions of, and uh, sort of historical uh, inertia about the politics of the Persian Gulf and oil, and I, it's time to rethink them given the huge transitions that the world economy has made with oil and also um, with alternative sources of uh, fossil fuels. Great. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Congressman Khanna for a, a moment, and then, then we'll turn it to questions. Thank you uh, to such a distinguished panel. I'm going to be brief. I wanted to be here for the introduction, but they called votes. Uh, and uh, I, I just wanted to thank, first of all, uh, Katrina for the idea of uh, assembling uh, this group, uh, Eric Sperling on my team, a lot of hard work and Geo Saba. Uh, let me say this. I think the Democratic Party and the Progressive Caucus uh, need a coherent progressive foreign policy. Uh, I don't believe we have one right now. Uh, I believe the six people uh, on this panel have done some of the leading thinking on how you have a foreign policy uh, based on restraint and emphasizing human rights uh, that doesn't turn into isolationism and how we have a 21st century that doesn't replicate the mistakes of the Cold War paradigm. Uh, my hope is that this conversation uh, is just the beginning uh, and that we will have the benefit of these extraordinary thinkers and uh, practitioners uh, in developing uh, a foreign policy platform uh, for the Progressive Caucus and ultimately uh, for our party. So I want to thank all of you for your insights. I look forward to uh, listening more and uh, hearing your responses to the question. Representative Khanna has tasked us with uh, crafting a platform. A platform should be one more of ideas fused with messages. This is a forum. It's just the beginning, I hope, of a series of discussions. I do think, and Andrew Basevich may disagree, though he's followed this more closely, I think, and Peter's written about this, that there is a real... Um, there is real support, a base of support for ending endless war in this country. I think that there is there's a lot we could work with with just a little messaging, and it's not false messaging. It's built. It's out there to be tapped into, and that's where I think the work needs to be done to speak more clearly, less defensively, not be uh, caught up in what happens so frequently on these TV shows. As Peter said, you get caught up arguing before you can make your point because you're arguing against, quote, the blob or the never Trumper. I'd add one thing. What's not helpful, and this speaks to demilitarizing our mindset, demilitarizing our discussions, is almost every night, and I'm talking MSNBC and CNN, not Fox, you have a passel of former Intel security chiefs, FBI, coming across the screen talking Truth to power, please. I mean, you know, one of them, I won't name names, perjured himself twice. And, you know, so I think we need a much wider representation of the full range of voices in this country. And we may not find it on cable, but we should make sure as people in this work, in this line of work, in the media, to make sure that happens. Because that's a first step in defining a different reality, one less militarized than happens too often. I thought it was a great response, and then we'll go to you guys. Okay. Oh, you want to get into it? 
Um, yeah, thought it was a great question. I want to repeat one thing I said earlier on. Look, when it comes to the framing, timing is extremely important. Because of the lack of a framework, it takes longer for the progressives to be able to figure it out. By the time it's out, the other side has already framed the issue. That's part of it. The other part of it that is uh, also important is that too often we have tried to change policy without changing the paradigm that the yeah. entire conversation is in. And it oftentimes leads to just marginal changes, and most often those marginal changes tend to be rather short-lived. I think we are in a moment right now, it's very clear, we need to have a different paradigm of how to approach foreign policy, as Andrew said, a different narrative. Yeah. That needs to be promoted very, very proactively. It needs to start every answer to any question that Peter has asked uh, on MSNBC in order for us to be able to reach the point in which the viewers and everyone else are open to arguments that are coming from a completely different place because they're no longer uh, structured to only be able to understand the stuff that is coming from within the existing. Peter, if I may, real, I'm sorry. I think Nita, 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 okay. Quickly, I think the master frame is fear. We focus on threats when we're afraid. And we tend to uh, not pay attention to disconfirming evidence. So uh, the, the big move, I think, would be to focus our, our thoughts uh, less on, on emphasizing, hyping fear, and uh, to think more about uh, alternatives which actually would make us less insecure. So that the first step is deal with the fact that we've got a fearful populace, and the second step is to consistently argue, as I try to do, that the current policies are ineffective, counterproductive, and wrong. It's that simple, and we can show how they are and then offer more effective, productive, and morally-based policies. Well, I, I, we, need, we need to hammer away relentlessly at the failures that have occurred over the past uh, couple of decades, or the entire post-Cold War uh, era. Uh, I joked that you know, we should have the results of Nita's research and some kind of flashing lights in the rotunda, but that was only half joking. M my sense is that American people basically have forgotten the Iraq war. Once, once U.S. casualties decline to next to nothing, then the American people are moving on. And in that sense, the architects of that war, of the Afghanistan war, of the entire global war on terrorism, get away with it. Uh, there is no accountability. And so we have to, to continue to remind Americans of, of, the, of the catastrophe that we have sustained because of this over-militarized approach to foreign policy. Uh, yes, it is part of what's, what's getting in the way. I, I think that the, the, the debate over uh, Israel-Palestine is a debate that most members of Congress have not really joined. It's, it's, based, it's, it's led by a relatively small number of, of members of Congress who are considered to be experts on the subject. And one of the problems with the fact that other people don't enter into the debate is they often, uh, and this, have, has, this goes not only for the members of Congress who are engaged in the issue, but it goes for the, some of the activists and major organizations like APAC and also some of the media commentators, is because other people don't enter into the debate. They don't actually realize that these folks who are dominating the debate don't know nearly as much as one might assume that they do. Because remember, the debate is basically dominated by people who actually really don't engage with Palestinians much at all. So their understanding of Palestinian reality is often extremely limited. Um, and um, so I think that if one starts to challenge these things, I think one can start to see that uh, people like uh, Representative Elliot Engel, for instance, are not actually great, uh, great scholars of the conflict. Um, uh, and actually have, it wouldn't take very long at all to actually have a better understanding um, of, 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 what Israeli, of what Palestinian life under Israeli control is like. Um, so again, I, th and I, I would also say, and I say this is someone who has, seen this issue over many years, both from the position of a critic of the kind of pro-Israel establishment, also from a fair amount of time spent inside of that world, because it's my community in all kinds of different ways, is that um, what can look very imposing from the outside is not necessarily so imposing when you see it from the inside, because there are a lot of people inside that world themselves who actually are not necessarily themselves late at night are not necessarily sure that they themselves are on the sides of the angels at all. 
I've had a number of really quite remarkable conversations over the last few years with people who take me aside privately and basically say, one woman who basically, her job is to fight the BDS movement, privately told me that she herself will not buy products from the West Bank. Um, there, there is, again, one, there, there's actually, what looks very imposing from the outside is actually there are many, many second thoughts and moral qualms, I think, that exist, but simply are not being given the space to be, to be vocalized. Um, uh, would, uh, um, so, I, I mean, I think you're right that in some, ex some extent the, 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 the discourse hasn't moved as much as, as one would have liked. But somebody who's of a certain generation, it's moved already quite a bit. I mean, a lot of things that are being debated today, you wouldn't have debated uh, 10, 20 years ago. I don't know, Peter, if you would agree with that. In some ways, the speed has surprised me just because one becomes jaded with age. The, the, but the other point is I think there's something bubbling on campuses, and one of my colleagues is writing a, a, a piece on this, uh, which will come out soon, about the debates on campus. Now, it hasn't yet caught up with Congress, but <laughs> at some point it will. Um, and I think what is really making a difference is the way, talking about framing, framing this as a rights-based issue. That really does, as, as, as I think Peter said, that's where people have to think again. Um, and it's not, you know, you're, you're, you're really framing it in terms of civil rights, human rights, and the way people are being treated. I feel that people then, it's much harder for them to respond. Um, and we have the same experience. Again, it's, 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 uh, it's documented in this piece about people who may say something publicly, but privately their the qualms are much greater, and people whose views change when they confront the kinds of questions that Peter uh, put out. So I, on this one, I'm not, I'm not a pessimist. I actually think things have, have moved at, at a speed that I would have been uh, happy if somebody had told me 10 years ago it would have occurred. It looks to me like the, the role of defense contractors has been fairly consistent for the last 30 years in a couple of respects. One is um, we keep paying them whatever they ask um, and uh, accept their delays, right? So uh, but the, the, thing, the other part of that is that they're, they've been roughly 15% of the manufacturing economy for the last 30 years, 15%. Um, Yet they have fewer jobs. They're, the number of jobs employed in defense has declined. So that tells me that their relative inefficiency at producing jobs has actually grown, if that makes any sense. Right? In other words, it's an unproductive sector of the economy that we just keep paying to do uh, the same things, which is to charge us more for items that may or may not work. So um, that's, that's part of it. Uh, we need to, to challenge much about the way they operate. And the second thing is, it's not just defense contractors. It's um, the oil lobby. And sometimes they're very closely related. And they're part of the reason why we're so interested in protecting the Persian Gulf. It's not just that it's our oil, we think, that we want to pay a certain price for our oil. But it's also uh, the interests of the major corporations that have facilities in those places that do the refining and so on. Peter? Yeah. I, uh, we need to remember that the most effective critic of the military industrial complex is the guy who articulated that phrase, who happened to be a five-star general. And I'm serious now that it, it seems to me progressives need to, on this particular issue, Progressives need to identify uh, retired senior military officers, many of whom, of course, are in bed with the defense contractors, but some of whom, I believe, can become articulate critics of the policies that we are discussing. And if they can become part of the progressive critique of foreign policy, to some degree that will then insulate uh, progressives from the charge, well, they're just a bunch of doves and they don't like soldiers uh, anyway. I was gonna, could I just, uh, Katrina and Tabea, go ahead. Um, Trita may know the name, but a group started a few days ago called Costs of Defense, I believe. It's formed uh, by veterans, former military, and it's aimed at ending endless war. And John Tester has signed on. I think it's a transpartisan group, but it speaks to what Andrew says. I think that, again, um, you can find people, you'd be surprised, who would recoil at essentially 
the war profiteering. I mean, the other thing to maybe revive, I'm a believer in retrieving our own history, war profiteering hearings. I mean, there's a, there are a lot of hearings going on in this place uh, about Trump and tax returns. I mean, but I think that would be of, uh, of value in exposing the gouging, the unproductive nature, as Nita said, of this industry and how the funds deployed in this industry, which are not audited, by the way, and when they are audited, our story showed that the overruns could be used far more productively in health education. But it does require, and I'll come back briefly, to a kind of 21st century conversion, which again is in our history, but it's about just transition. Have people heard that word? I mean, it's often used for like coal workers, but it's for defense workers too, because you can't just walk into a community and say, we're shutting down, no more jobs. There has to be a faith that there will be retraining, um, modernization. And the last thing I'll say is very dangerous what's happening on the nuclear front. This nuclear modernization is more than just throwing money, trillions. It's about, again, low yield usable weapons. It's a whole new arena. It's gonna bring in artificial intelligence. It's gonna bring in universities and it's gonna really bloat defense budget, which the Congressional Progressive Caucus over the years has always produced an alternative defense budget, and it becomes ever more important in these times to show that we can remain secure, but at levels that are not, as Nita said, unsustainable and obscene. Just add one thing. It's a very important question, and I think it goes to the larger issue of, you know, some issues seem to be in the stranglehold of specific lobbies that are very, very powerful. And sometimes that is actually a very dangerous way of looking at it because we make them more powerful in our own mind than they actually prove to be. Uh, there were several organizations that were up against uh, a network of very influential organizations, oftentimes viewed as being too influential on the Iran deal. Mm -hmm. But they, those influential organizations lost. Then you had the 2013 moment when the Obama administration uh, took the issue to Congress in regards to going into Syria. And the Obama administration lobbied for it. There were some of these other very influential organizations lobbied for it. The defense contracts and the military industrial uh, complex lobbied for it, and they lost massively. Many members of Congress said that they got like, I think one call out of 99 against going in militarily. What it tells us is that many of these groups that have a master reputation and sometimes promoted that rem reputation because it has a deterring effect that they are overwhelmingly influential, tend to be so when the American public is absent. But in those unique moments when you actually mobilize a very large number of Americans, it proves that they are actually more paper tigers than completely dominant. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that they're overwhelmingly influential, that it's gonna be easy, but it's very important to make sure that we don't um, disempower ourselves by aggrandizing the power of the other side. Great. I was told that we should end at 3.30, and I want to prove that progressives can be disciplined. Um, so, um, so we're going to do that. Um, I wanted to thank, uh, most of all, uh, uh, Congressman Khanna for convening this, uh, and Eric Sperling for, for doing all the yeoman's work, uh, and Nita Crawford, Trita Parsi, Rob Malley, Katrina Vanden Heuvel, and Andrew Basevich. Thank you very much.